Updating communication for the 21st century. The issues surrounding internet access in rural and urban regions of our state are a recurring topic. We dive into the future of Iowa broadband on this edition of Iowa Press. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Iowa PBS is supported in part by Wells Fargo. Fuel Iowa is a voice and a resource for Iowa's fuel industry. Our members offer a diverse range of products, including fuel, grocery, and convenience items. They help keep Iowans on the move in rural and urban communities. Together, we fuel Iowa. Small businesses are the backbone of Iowa's communities, and they are backed by Iowa banks. With advice, loans, and financial services, banks across Iowa are committed to showing small businesses the way to a stronger tomorrow. Learn more at iowabankers.com. For decades, Iowa Press has brought you politicians and newsmakers from across Iowa and beyond. Celebrating nearly 50 years of broadcast excellence on statewide Iowa PBS. This is the Friday, April 30 edition of Iowa Press. Here is David Yepsen. Viewers of this program over the past few decades have heard their fair share of governors, senators, and state legislators all promote the promise of rural broadband. The ultimate goal of high-speed internet access to all corners of Iowa and rural America has long been linked to economic development. In Iowa this week, Governor Reynolds signed a bill creating a new $100 million broadband grant program. And here to discuss the challenges and opportunities ahead are a pair of experts in this field. Brian Waller is president of the Technology Association of Iowa, a member-based group advocating for initiatives in the state's technology economy. And Dave Duncan is CEO of the Iowa Communications Alliance, representing broadband providers throughout the state. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Glad to have you with us. Thanks for making time. Thank you. Great to be here. Also across the table is Aaron Murphy, Des Moines Bureau Chief for Lee Enterprises and Radio Iowa News Director Kay Henderson. Dave Duncan, the legislature and the governor have agreed to set aside $100 million in the next year. The governor is hoping for a total of 450 over a three-year period. Once that investment is made, is it done? We hope so. Uh, there's a lot of challenges out there uh, that we're currently seeing. Um, there's a lot of good examples of places in Iowa that are connected with great broadband, but there's still far too many areas that are not connected. And so we're focusing on the areas that are not connected, and those are areas that have already gone through five rounds of prior funding through, we call them NOFAs, Notice of Funding Availabilities, five rounds of funding, and they still haven't received um, bidders to go serve those areas. So that's why this current program has incentivized 75% uh, state funding to really attack and, and, and direct money at those areas first. But we do believe that this is going to make Iowa one of the most connected states in the country. Brian Waller, uh, the governor has said this will spur private investment. How much private investment? Well, it's hard to say how much private investment, and I would just kind of counter to Dave, I don't think it will be done with the $40 million. We have uh, members of ours that buy, uh, that invest in technology services, and you know you have to enhance, you have to maintain those services, but we all know that if the state of Iowa has broadband connectivity across the whole state, that means rural Iowa has an, has an opportunity to participate in the future economy and in the information economy, which will spur some private investment, I believe, in those parts. Um the governor has said, you know, download and upload speeds in Iowa, I believe, universally are the second slowest in the country. It, um, is Iowa, Dave, making the largest investment of any state? Do you know how this compares? Yes, it's one of the largest. I just learned the other day that Indiana has also a $100 million program. Some other states, uh, uh, Indiana, or, I'm sorry, Illinois and New York have made significant investments. Uh, but in terms of what this program does with requiring 
most of the build out to be 100 megabits download, 100 megabits upload, which we believe is kind of defined as future proof networks. That's really going to take Iowa to the top. So before we get too far into the weeds, we actually wanted to back out uh, and take the big picture view on all this and, and help any viewers who may have been hearing all this about broadband, internet, and maybe know a little bit, but not, not everything of what we're talking about here. Let me just start with what, what is broadband, and Brian Waller, I'll ask you first, what is broadband internet? How, how do we define that? So we, we are kind of technology agnostic at the Technology Association of Iowa. And for us, that means speed and latency uh, of, of interacting through the internet. And so that could be the pipes and the plumbing in the ground of broadband. But we also see broadband as satellite, as cellular. And those are going to be the emerging technologies. That's why this project will never be done, because technology moves so rapidly. Like I said, cellular or satellite. And so for us, it's speed and latency in the internet. And it comes from all different ways. And why is expanding broadband access, Dave Duncan, I'll ask you, to uh, the, all areas of the state, why is it important for uh, everybody in Iowa to have access to, to this kind of Internet service? We have just seen in the last year, Aaron, two uh, significant events. The pandemic, obviously, when people are trying to work from home, they're trying to study from home, they have multiple people at home on their computers at the same time trying to do video, Zoom meetings, or watching teachers and, and interacting. That requires a lot of bandwidth. And so uh, we need everybody in Iowa to be connected. The other piece that we've seen is during the derecho last summer, we've seen the need for resilient networks, networks that don't go down when the wind comes through. And so, um, quite honestly, a lot of the um, networks that our members have uh, deployed fiber optic in the ground had no outages. The outages were on the electrical side, but not on the broadband side. So you've got the need for speed and you need for resilience through tough events. Brian Waller, um, this reminds me of the rural electric, electric cooperatives of the Great Depression era. And there the, the government said, part of the New Deal, uh, rural, rural America is not being served by the uh, electric companies uh, that, that existed then. And so we're going to create a government entity to subsidize and encourage uh, this development. Great. Seems to have worked. You go into rural Iowa now and you can go into any dairy parley, flick a switch and you got electricity. Nobody thinks about it. Are we ever going to reach a point with broadband where anybody in rural Iowa is going to be able to quote unquote flick a switch and have big time capacity? We're going to get there. And How I think, soon? Uh, that's a great question. And I think the, anybody that has the answer to that, well, I have some oceanfront property in Arizona that yeah. I'd like to sell you. Um, but I can tell you that um, uh, the 1930s rural electrification of Iowa, which you mentioned, this undertaking is exactly like that. And I believe we'll get there like we can flip on a switch in any rural part of the state. And I think in the next three to five years, given the governor's approach, and Dave represents these rural telcos to make it happen, I think you're going to see extreme in, uh, increased advancement in the next 36 months, actually. D uh, Dave Duncan, same question to you. How soon uh, do you think this is just going to be taken for granted? I hope soon. Um, the governor has laid out an ambitious goal, and this goal was based on input that she received from Empower Rural Iowa Initiative and from the Economic Recovery Advisory Board. So she's been seeking uh, input from all different sorts of business leaders and community leaders from throughout the state that said we wanted to connect, or she wanted to connect, all Iowans with minimum basic broadband by the end of this year at 25 megabit download, 3 megabit upload, but within four years have all Iowa connected with future-proof broadband. And we hope we can get there. One of the problems, when Brian kind of talked about it a little bit though, is the goalposts somewhat are moving because as there's new technologies, there's new needs, pretty soon what you think was good uh, bandwidth and service before now is not quite so adequate because when we move to all kinds of new, whether it's holographic or 3D or new, new technologies, it's gonna require yet even more bandwidth. Okay. Brian Waller, during debate, Democrats raised concerns that if you build it, perhaps low-income Iowans won't be able to afford it. Mm -hmm. um, how is that going to work? How are companies that are digging trenches and doing whatever going to provide a service that's affordable? 
That is a great question and something I think an important one we need to consider because we're talking about availability and accessibility. The availability will be there, but is it accessible to Iowans? Mm -hmm. So I think there's a couple approaches. There could be a role for government to subsidize to low to moderate income Iowans to be part of this digital economy. But I also can see there's creative communities around the state that are doing things. I look at Cedar Rapids and I'm on communication. They put in pre free Wi-Fi around the public library around Cedar Rapids. And every night they would see a car come up for three days and drive away. So finally on the fourth, they went up there and they said, what are you doing here? Well, it was the two kids doing their school homework in the back seat because they couldn't afford the internet. And so I think there are creative solutions on the community side that could have free Wi-Fi uh, hotspots on Main Street or a park. But also, I do believe it's going to take some sort of government subsidy to make sure these Iowans are not left out of the innovation economy. Um, electricity is considered a utility, and there's a utilities board that regulates rates. Is it time for broadband service to be regulated? Well, the FCC has... Uh, issued a directive many years ago that said broadband service is to be regulated on the national level, not the state level, because it's an it's a interstate device. Right. So historically, the IUB um, has regulated telephone service, and they've gone through deregulation on the telephone side. And one of the reasons was the advent of more competition, but then also to allow some of those companies to focus more on broadband. So we do see on the federal side, there, there's going to be more discussion about regulating services and rates, perhaps, um, at the FCC level. And for example, to follow up with the question you just had, uh, coming out in early in, um, well, maybe it's middle of May, the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program from the FCC will offer uh, significant discounts for broadband service for consumers. Brian Waller. Go back to the the uh, RECs. You know, when those were created, the private companies pushed back uh, against those. It was considered socialism. A lot of concern in the Republican Party about socialism today. What do you say to the argument you're just expanding government and government subsidies uh, to create this? We don't. A lot of people don't like the idea of that. Mm -hmm. I would say we're we're leveling the playing field. Again, we're, we're, we're trying to revitalize rural Iowa. So if you are born and raised in rural Iowa and uh, you don't have to leave to go to a large metro to work in a job of a technology job, but you can do that there, I think we're leveling the playing field and we're giving Iowans an opportunity to be a part of the future economy where so many are left out given their lack of connectivity. Not only the lack of connectivity, but their own skills of how to, to utilize the vast resources that the internet offers. Aaron. So we've talked about the different kinds of deserts that exist here, and either through access or affordability. Part of the whole push behind the governor's bill and, and the expansion of broadband is to get access to, to everyone. How clear a picture do we have of where those deserts are, where those needs are? I'll, I'll start with you, Brian Waller. Do, is, is that something we have nailed down in a very clear picture of, or, or is that kind of murky? Uh, very clear picture, and I think Dave could probably answer that, but I would say it's not just rural Iowa. You look at the Des Moines metro area, and there are parts where kids were going online in Des Moines Public School that didn't have internet access or proper internet access. There's stories of people that go into a different part of their neighborhood to download Netflix, then go home so they can watch it because they can't stream. And so, sure, the focus is on rural, but there are urban parts here low to moderate income neighborhoods that don't have access as well. But, but I think Dave can really paint that picture. Yeah, Dave, in fact, your organization was attempting to kind of map this, right, to determine uh, on a granular level where these needs are. It is very difficult. <laughs> uh, and, and quite honestly, uh, the, the maps that are being used at the federal level and the state level are not entirely accurate. Uh, because they're based on census block. And if there's one consumer that might have access to service in that census block, it's indicated as served. And all the rest of the people in that census block say, well, what about me, right? Uh, I just heard a media report uh, the other night that uh, Van Buren County was one of the least connected uh, counties in the state. And I, I did a little research this morning on it, and I found that we have one company down there, Van Buren Telephone, that actually offers fiber to the home to about 60% of that county. So I'm not sure where that data came from. So there's, there's questions on different maps and different ways of looking at things. So, and I guess that gets to my point. So yeah. we're throwing $100 million at this. Do we know where this needs to be invested? 
Well, there's actually going to be a new mapping project that Connected Nation is working with the state on right now. It's gathering data, and it's going to put together a new map that we hope is much better, and it's supposed to come out by July 1st. Brian so Waller, you mentioned um, the level of technology is always changing. Mm -hmm. So what is the shelf life for the broadband that the, the most of these grants will be going to, the 100 megabit download and upload speed? Today's point, the goalpost is continuing to be moved. But I think the first fundamental step is to get the plumbing in the ground, and that's broadband. And I think those areas that have no latency, that there's no extra mile getting to that acreage or that farm, that pipe in the ground, to me, is somewhat future-proof. The satellite stuff that we talked about, the cellular, some of those things will co constantly change, but that first step to get the plumbing, I think, is somewhat future-proof uh, to what Dave mentioned as well when it comes to, to, to weather and different sort of extreme circumstances as well. Dave, um, how soon before everybody can get four bars anywhere in Iowa? <laughs> On the cellular service? Mm -hmm. Is this going to have an effect on this? Well, actually, a lot of people don't realize that all of the cell towers need to be connected with fiber optic cable so that below the ground. Come. So you got to have fiber connecting the whole state to have towers all over the whole state. So give me yes. a give me a guess on what what sort of timelines are we looking at? How long to get all the fiber in? How long before it's it is is uh, usable? To, so you can get four bars out in a cornfield anywhere. Yeah, and of course, part of the problem, as you know, is is topography and, and hills and trees and things like that and valleys. Uh, but we're still, we're 100% we're with the governor's program that says within four years we hope to get everybody connected. Um, the, uh, the other push behind this is, uh, and you mentioned this, Brian, that it's not just rural, but that is one of the focuses of this is, is getting uh, broadband access to rural areas where it may be lacking. And, and there's the suggestion that that will help uh, population loss help defeat population loss in these areas. How, how, uh, I'll start with you, Dave Duncan, on this. How sure are we of that? I, I mean, we're, that, that's being pushed. A reason to, to invest all this money in this is it's going to help rural areas and small towns. Are, are we sure of that? It, it will, will this bring people back to those areas in Iowa? Especially with telecommuting options. Uh, more and more people are able to work from home. Uh, and not have to, to, to move to the big cities to work. I also believe from the other side of things, if a town doesn't have broadband, it's going to lose people. So you need to have great access just, to, first of all, to keep people in your area. But then with this whole push for um, universal connectivity, uh, then people can work from small towns and enjoy the quality of life in rural Iowa. I, I would say along with that, there's going to be a challenge when you give people access to a system of vast resources that they've never utilized before. I mean, most people in small town Iowa are still going to the bank to deposit a check, where I would typically just do it online. So there's going to be a huge gap. Once you give access to these systems, how do we upskill Iowans to utilize telemedicine, to utilize banking through a virtual experience, to utilize these systems? I think on the social side, once you give them access, that's, that's a whole other layer of challenges that will come for Iowa for sure. You've described this um, future-proof broadband, which is 100 megabit upload-download, but the bill also will now allow um, grants to go to companies that do sort of a, a lower technology. Is that worth it? Yes. Um, there were discussions throughout the process of this legislation as to trying to keep the 100 by 100 megabit requirement in there. But there were enough legislators who said in their area that maybe the best way to serve these unserved Iowans was through fixed wireless with the antenna. And current technology allows fixed wireless to do 100 by 20, which is a lot better than what they had before. It's not as great as 100 by 100. Um, but those legislators were saying, we want this type of service, and this may be the best way to do it. Um, Brian. Uh, governor, former Governor uh, Terry Branstead about a decade ago talked about connecting every acre mm -hmm. um, because farm equipment now needs connectivity. Mm -hmm. um, is that possible? It is. And I think sometimes it's not worth that extra mile to get to that farm. But you just mentioned precision agriculture, and uh, that's not going anywhere. Autonomous vehicles. Someday you're going to look around Iowa and there's going to be driverless vehicles on our roads. Well, you're going to need high-speed internet and connectivity and communication between these vehicles. 
And I would hate for us not to be part of the future because precision agriculture, autonomous vehicles, creative technology solutions, that's in our DNA. And so we need to be on the cusp of emerging technologies in the future as well. How do we, you mentioned earlier, upskilling people. Um, you know, some of us could never program a VCR. Uh, we <laughs> have Iowans who could not access during this pandemic shots because they don't do. They don't have smartphones. There's great stories of young people helping the older folks in town. So how do we upskill people so that they're going to take advantage of this? I think that's the role of our government. I think that's the role of our school districts. I think that's the role of our communities. Because once again, you're going to give them access of these vast resources that they've never utilized. I mean, people are going online and buying homes online without looking at them. But you also have a vast amount of Iowans who aren't comfortable taking that leap just to, to, to deposit a check virtually. It's uh, Dave, uh, Harold Hughes is remembered as a great governor in Iowa because he built the community college system. Is this uh, 75, 50 years from now going to be uh, what we remember Kim Reynolds for? I hope so, uh, because this is, as far as I know, it's one of the biggest investments that the state of Iowa has made in any infrastructure project. Dave, you mentioned earlier the, the pandemic and the derecho and, and how that's kind of amplified maybe some of the needs and we, and we wanted to talk a little bit more about that. So beyond just the need for access, what, what did either of those events show us about uh, broadband and how important it is to Iowans and, and their lives, especially in times of crises? Yeah, and I think Brian's pointed out a couple of great examples. When we're talking about broadband being used for almost every kind of daily purpose and daily activity that, that people have, ranging from, you know, when you wake up in the morning to accessing news to um, getting online and doing, uh, uh, getting your driver's license renewed and then, then going to work and communicating with people from across the country. It's just everything is, is interconnected together and you got to be connected to be interconnected. Brian, same question to you. Um, I, I would agree with Dave. I just think the economy is moving at such a rapid speed that you're going to need broadband access connectivity and you're going to need it throughout the state. And it's, uh, it's going to be imperative. And uh, I believe the governor, this will be what she's remembered for if this goes through and, and she accomplishes this goal. Brian Waller, we all have um, disruptions in our electric service. Mm -hmm. And I live in a neighborhood where the lines are buried. Um, so broadband's buried. How, do, how does this service get disrupted? And, there, and are there steps that providers should take to protect from disruptions? What are those? I, I think, to Dave's point too, is when you put broadband in the ground, it's, pr it's pretty future-proof. I mean, you're, and the communities are working with those individuals. Okay. It's the stuff that's gonna be in the air. It's the satellites, it's the cellulars that are a little more uh, susceptible to winds and some, some treacherous weather. But I believe, again, getting the plumbing is the ground, in the ground is the first step to having all Iowans be part of the, part of the future economy. President Joe Biden's infrastructure package has created this unique debate about what is infrastructure, maybe expanded the definition. Uh, Dave Duncan, is broadband internet infrastructure? Absolutely. Why? It is as important to people as water, as electricity, um, especially if you're moving into a new house. Uh, people are asking, almost before they ask about any other type of connections, does this house have good broadband connection? It is so critical um, to anybody where you work, where you live, where you go to school, um, where you work. Um, it is infrastructure. Brian, do you agree? Totally agree. And when it comes to funding, if a federal government's going to do an infrastructure package, we want uh, broadband to be part of that, especially when you talk about uh, electrifying or bringing broadband to rural America. And former Governor Vilsack is, is the head of the USDA that could be a part of that. I think the stars are aligning for Iowa, and we want broadband to be part of the infrastructure conversation. The, the governor has talked about being able to supplement uh, what she's done with this bill uh, with some assistance for, from the federal government as well. Do, do you gentlemen see that as well? Brian, is there opportunities to, to use federal assistance to even build on what the governor is proposing? And I believe that is the plan. It is, you know, we're going to put our stake in the game first, but I believe there's going to be other monies federally coming through. I mean, listening to the Biden administration talk about infrastructure and, and some of the things that they want to accomplish, I think Iowa could really benefit from an infrastructure package. Dave, um, first responders oftentimes can't communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. Is this going to fix that problem? 
Actually, um, first responders are taking advantage of FirstNet, which is a different network that has been put in place over the past couple years that gives them dedicated service that would knock everybody else off, give first responders um, priority service for uh, their devices. And so uh, I believe that, that this will help, but we already have been taking steps to assist first responders. Is that through cell towers, though, correct? That is through cell towers. Would wouldn't it be better to have it through just a hardwire and broadband? Uh, it depends on which part of the first responder and what emergency management piece you're talking about. If you're talking about an accident out in the field or you know even a mass major event, uh, then then it's going to be wireless. But uh, there obviously the the need for fiber to connect all kinds of different communication sources is there. Brian, we just a few seconds left. Will this enable the state to get rid of the Iowa Communications Network, the ICN? State built this network. Uh, do, why do we need that anymore? Uh, you're going to still need the ICN. I don't think you invest so much money in the ICN and then walk away, like walk away from it. I think this broadband conversation is about the Iowa citizen. It's the Iowa citizen that doesn't have access. And so to, for us, I think the ICN could be utilized in new ways, but I don't think it's going anywhere, Dave. Okay. I've got to go someplace, and so we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to both for, uh, for being with us today. Appreciate it. Thank you. And we'll be back next week with another edition of Iowa Press at our regular times, 7.30 Friday night at noon on Sunday. For all of us here at Iowa PBS, I'm David Yepsen, and thanks for joining us today. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation, the Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Iowa PBS is supported in part by Wells Fargo. Fuel Iowa is a voice and a resource for Iowa's fuel industry. Our members offer a diverse range of products, including fuel, grocery, and convenience items. They help keep Iowans on the move in rural and urban communities. Together, we fuel Iowa. Small businesses are the backbone of Iowa's communities, and they are backed by Iowa banks. With advice, loans, and financial services, banks across Iowa are committed to showing small businesses the way to a stronger tomorrow. Learn more at iowabankers.com.